Hi everyone, I'm Alton Hopes. And I'm Gabrielle Burkhart. And this is our proposal story. Uh, so we got engaged last August and it all started out um, with me asking her dad for his blessing and then we did some ring shopping and she had joked around a few times, wow, it'd be a dream to get engaged at, uh, in Paris at the uh, Eiffel Tower. And little did she know I was gonna make that come true because uh, her family had a vacation planned over there in the summer so I worked with her parents to um, make a surprise trip over there and just told her I was going on a different work trip and uh, it all ended up working out. I was able to sneak over there. I told her parents exactly where to meet at the Eiffel Tower um, one night when it'd be lit up at a certain time so uh, I was tracking them on my phone from the nearby park as they're getting closer and closer. I um, started making my way towards the meeting point and then I realized there's a whole nother flight of stairs a few city blocks down I had to go down to get close to the river so I had three or four minutes to spare I had to run down and uh, to those stairs and then run back and essentially chasing them and I finally got to the bridge right by the tower about a minute to spare and I was looking around, there's a lot of people, and I finally spotted them sitting next to the water. They, they made her face away so I could sneak up behind them. And uh, then as soon as the top of the hour struck and the tower lit up, uh, then I asked her to marry me, and the rest is history from there. It was incredible, and it was just so sweet with the intentionality that you planned all of this out. So it just, the whole thing made me feel super loved. First off, all of you ladies that are right now looking at your husbands and going, really? <laughs> Knock it off, okay? It didn't work out for all of us to go out to Paris and meet our, our brides-to-be at the Eiffel Tower. Some of us had to meet at the bottom of a frozen river and have their soon-to-be bride begrudgingly come up to the place that you were about to propose to her, okay? We didn't all, no. I have had... I actually had like three openings, so can I give you another one too? Okay, that was, that was one opening. Here's another one. Here we go. Marriage is but brings us together. No? Okay. No, that, that's not why we're here either. I've had an incredible opportunity over the time that I've been a pastor to sit down with uh, numerous couples and just do some premarital counseling with them. And when I do this, there are several questions that I always start with. I start off with questions about, how did you meet? Like, walk me through the story of how did you two get to know each other in the first place? And I've heard the stories from it's in college or, you know, we, we grew up together and we've always known each other to the ones who, yeah, when we first met, we actually weren't at all attracted to each other. And we thought there is no way that I'm ever going to be interested in that person. And, well, now we're getting married. And so I've heard all of the stories. That's one question I love to ask. I love to ask the question of, at what point did you know that this is a person that you could find yourself marrying? This is a person that you could find yourself living with for the rest of your life. Not the, when did you know that they were the one, but, but at what point did you start to get that feeling like this could be the last person that I ever date in my entire life? And then the third question that I love to ask is walk me through the proposal story. Walk me through what that looked like. And now, we can, all, all those of us who are married sitting in this room, we might think through, what, what did my proposal story look like? And for some of us, like it was this big, extravagant, it, it was meeting at the Eiffel Tower and finding out that you're not in the same spot that you thought you were going to be in and, and run into that, but with this extravagant plan. And for some, you had an extravagant plan, and then something happened, and it all fell apart, and you finally just got to the point, and you said, well, do you want to get married? And that was basically the extent of the proposal. The, the, the stories can span so many, so many different possibilities, but I love something that Gabby said at the very end of that because I think it captures so many of the stories that we have. That the proposal stories that we have are full of intentionality. I don't know very many people. There are some. There are exceptions to every rule, but I don't know very many that would say that their proposal story, that moment where you know they, they got down on a knee or whatever it is, just came as a spur of the moment, no planning whatsoever, no ring in hand, no idea that this was about to happen. It happens, yes, but most of the time, the stories that I hear 
or man, I, I worked on this for weeks, or this, this, the plans for this started coming into motion months ahead of time. I was intentional about what it was that I was going to do. And now again, ladies, if you're looking at your husband and going, that doesn't sound like you at all. Knock it off. Let him off the hook. You already married him. It's over, okay? You're not going to redo the proposal story. This morning, we get to come here, and we get to celebrate this thing called Easter, And this morning, I want to tell you a different story of pursuit, a different story full of promises, a different proposal story. It's a story full of intentionality. In Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 24, we read this, men of Israel, listen to this, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you, and don't miss this part, by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. I could translate that to say, this man was handed over to you intentionally. This was planned out. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. In Acts chapter 4, just for us, two pages later, we see another conversation where it says, Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed. They did what your power and will, and don't miss this, had decided beforehand should happen. This cross that we wear on necklaces, this cross that we tattoo on our bodies, this cross that we see all over, this cross that we have right up there, you can go outside on the other side of that wall and see another one. This cross was put in place intentionally. It was a plan that was laid out years and centuries ahead of time, since the beginning of time, this plan for Jesus Christ to propose to us, to come to us, was already, the groundwork was already being laid. Jesus planned his proposal to us with intentionality. It was no accident. But even in that, and actually I would say, this is even more proof of the, of the plan that went into this and the planning ahead of time that went into this is that for some of us, when we got to that moment of proposing, and some of you who someday are going to get to that moment of proposing, there's that second of, I don't know about this. I'm not sure. I've got the jitters. I've got cold feet. Whatever word it is that we want to use, there was, there was a moment where Jesus was in a garden. And he says, Father, If you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus knew what was coming on that cross. Day after day, Jesus would have walked by the place of the skull. He would have walked by Golgotha where he saw other criminals hanging from a cross, knowing that that was his destiny, that that was his future. And when the time came for him to take that step, for him to put that proposal forward, he had a moment where he's like, I, I don't want to do this. Like, do, you, do you understand the commitment that is involved in this? Do you understand how big of a step this is? How di- I'm, I am giving up everything. Some of us understand that feeling to a limited scope of I am giving up everything if I make this commitment. If I make this commitment to a spouse, if we have our children, I, I, I'm giving up everything. And Jesus had that moment where he's like, I'm, I'm going to give up. I'm going to have to experience that on a cross. But not my will, your predetermined plan, the one that we went into with foreknowledge, that will be done. See, the cross was his proposal to you and to me. The cross was his Eiffel Tower. The cross was his frozen waterfall. The cross was that moment where Jesus, he wasn't down on a knee, but with arms stretched wide, he invited us to live with him for all of eternity. 
When that moment comes that a proposal is laid out and the question is asked, will you marry me? It's at that moment that a big, big decision is made. We know that. It's in that moment that we have to decide, are we going to say yes, are we going to say no? And we begin to run through, what are the chances that this is a good idea? And to get there, we begin to look at the promises that have been made to us. And we begin to ask ourselves, will this person follow through with the promises that they've made? Well, in that vein, as we come to the, the wedding ceremony, there are, there are vows that I invite each couple to take. You've heard them. Even Oprah knows what these vows are. I saw it on the website. Oprah and Martha Stewart knew exactly what these vows were. For better, for worse, in sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer, till death do us part. We make those vows verbally on our wedding day, but those promises are being made when we are down on that knee. And I believe Jesus made those same promises to us. For better or for worse, in Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 22, Jesus says, blessed are you who hunger now. That's the worse. For you will be satisfied. That's the better. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. I am with you for better or for worse. We may be in the moment of worse now. We are considering all of eternity in the worse now. Notice Jesus doesn't make the promise there that if you will say yes to me, then the rest of your life is going to be perfect and the rest of your life is going to be easy. You will never hunger. You will never thirst. He doesn't make that promise. The promise he makes is that there is a kingdom waiting for you. You may be hungry now, but you will be satisfied later. You may weep now, but you will laugh later. People may hate you now, but you will be blessed because of that later. My promise to you is that I will walk through the worse with you to get you to the better. I won't snap my fingers and make it perfect for you now, but I will walk you through it, and I will take you to that moment. I will be with you for richer or for poorer. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, we read, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in Luke chapter 4, Jesus opened up a scroll and he read to the people standing there, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We may be in a state of poor right now, whether financially poor, emotionally poor, spiritually poor, but he says, I will stay with you during that. I'm not going to leave you and run for better riches because I already have them. And I'm here to provide them for you. The kingdom is ours when we say yes to him. In sickness and in health, he says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I have not come for the healthy. I have come for the sick. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 29, Jesus tells us, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus looks at us from the cross and he says, are you sick in body? I'm with you. I'm not going to abandon you and say, figure this out on your own. No, I may not snap my fingers and take it all away, but I will be like that spouse at the bedside, holding your hand and never, ever leaving your side. And we will walk to a place where you are healthy, where I will heal you. Are you distressed with burdens? I want to carry those for you. 
I want you to take those struggles that you have and I want you to put those on my shoulders. Your trials of heart, soul, mind, and strength are not going to scare him away as we sit here and we think, nobody would want a part of me. I am so incredibly messed up right now. Jesus says, no, you are exactly what I want. You are exactly who I have pursued and I've made promises to and who I am proposing to right now. I know your weaknesses and I know your failures and I still choose you. And I choose you until death do us part. In Mark chapter 15 and verse 37, we read that with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. At any moment, we need to understand this. At any moment, Jesus could have come down from that cross. At any moment, he could have called heaven's angels to come down to wipe out the Romans, to wipe out the Pharisees and the Sadducees who had put him there. At any moment, the agony and the torture could have been done. His life could have been restored. His breath could have been put back into his body. At any moment, he could have stopped it all. The criminals next to him had no power, but Jesus did. And instead, he hung there. Because he knew that that was the way to draw us to him. And that was the way to purify and to cleanse us. And now what he says to us, still 2,000 years later. He says, "I I have made my promises. I have made my proposal. Now I leave the choice up to you. What will you say? What do you say? Here's the beautiful thing about it. The the God of creation, the one who put all of this into motion, the one who could have stopped that moment on the cross, doesn't just say, look, I did all this, now say yes. But instead, he, he hangs there. And he says, weigh your options. If you're gonna say yes to me, I want you to know what you're getting yourself into. I don't want you to be the young woman or the young man who runs into marriage and has no idea what's coming down the road. I want you to weigh your options, weigh the cost. In Luke 14, verses 27 through 28, Jesus told us, anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. If you're going to say yes to me, it's going to mean carrying your cross as you follow me. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? I was just talking yesterday about building a pole barn, and you know what we talked about? Can I afford to build a pole barn? Or am I going to lay a foundation and get that laid and then go, well, I guess I'm out of money, I'm done. No, he says, weigh the cost, plan it out, look ahead. Are you willing to pay what it's going to take? Because just like any marriage, if you're not willing to give up any, everything, then it's not going to last. Weigh his promises out. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, I read this at almost every wedding. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her by the washing with water through the word. And he did that to present her, which her is us in this scenario, Her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. I gave my life. I gave up everything for you. I gave up everything so that you could be clean. I paid off all of your debts. Some of us get married after college and and maybe one spouse has a little bit more or a lot more college debt than the other one. And in a truly unified marriage, we don't look at each other and say, that's on you, figure it out. But we take it on. And we say, we are in this together to pay this off 
together. Now, I know that we live in a different culture, and we actually live in a culture where it's not that uncommon for spouses to look at one another and say, that's on you, you figure it out. Church, the way Christ laid out marriage is it is both of you 100% in, and it is all shared. All the baggage, all the debt, and all the profit. It is shared. If you want it to last, you follow his model. And he says, I took all of your sin. I took all of your debt, and I took care of it. I have never looked at you and said, that's on you. Figure it out. All I've asked you to do is say yes. In Hebrews 13, 5, it says, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. When we say yes to a marriage proposal today, most of us know that about 50% of marriages end in divorce. They don't, and that's not different inside the church. They don't last. And so as we're saying yes, many times we sit there with fear and, and we think, but what if, what if they let us down? What if they, they don't follow through with their promises? What if, what if they hurt me? Or what if I find somebody better? What if they forsake me? Jesus promises, I will never I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. I am all in on this. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. See, people, people let us down all the time. But Jesus doesn't. Jesus doesn't. The cross behind this wedding arch, the cross was his proposal to us. The cross was him saying, hey, I've made these promises. I'm gonna show you that, that I would do anything for you. I will let my body be torn apart and my blood poured out until the last breath leaves my lungs, and I will do all of that for you. We may sit there at the moment of proposal, or we may sit there on a wedding day thinking, but what if they don't? And Jesus has already shown us that he will. The cross is the proof that he would go to hell and back for us. But the tomb, the tomb is the proof that he can. The tomb is the proof that not only will, would I, if I was able to, but I can. I can fulfill all my promises. Because as we read those vows and we say until death do us part, hey, when one of them dies, they're not coming back. But Jesus said, no, no, no. But death itself could not hold me down. Death in itself can not keep me from you. The cross is me telling you that I would, but the tomb is me telling you that I can. That's what Easter is. It is Jesus coming to us and saying, will you say yes? I am all in on this. He is all in. And so the question becomes, what's your answer? What's your answer? Will you say yes? This morning is tailor-made for that moment of saying yes. Jesus, with intentionality, went to a cross to give of his life for us to prove to us that I will do all of the things that I told you I would do. I will fulfill every promise. That empty tomb that we remember this morning is the proof to us that he can do it. But we have to decide what our answer is. Weigh those costs. 
ask yourself, am I willing to give him everything? Because if you come into this with a, I'll give you some, it won't work. And it won't last. I know that there are some in here today who are sitting here and saying, I, I want to say yes. I need to say yes. If that's you this morning. This is your morning. This is your opportunity to say, don't wait until this afternoon to tell him yes. When I proposed to Sarah, she said yes right then. When anyone proposes, they're not looking for an answer five days later. This is your moment. There are others who are sitting here in this room who we've said yes before. But if we're being really honest, we haven't held up our end of it. And this morning is your moment to renew your vows with him. This morning is your moment to say, Jesus, I haven't done my part, but I want to. This is your chance to say yes again. And the beauty of him is he's not going to say, nope, sorry, too many chances. He's going to be there with open arms and saying yes right back to you. We don't do a lot of invitations to our altars up here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it this morning, and here's why. Jesus went to a cross with intentionality. He didn't sit in a pew and say, hey, will you be my disciple? Will you follow me? He didn't sit in a pew where he was comfortable and nobody would look at him and say, hey, Will you be with me for the rest of your life and into eternity? No, Jesus spread his arms on a cross and he rose from the dead in a tomb for all to see. When we get married, and again, I understand there are exceptions to everything. When Alton and Gabby get married here in a few months, they're not gonna do it with just the two of them and me. We invite our family, we invite our friends, we invite the people that we don't actually want to show up but we hope they'll send us a gift. We don't sit there and embarrassingly and ashamedly say our vows to one another. We do it, and these days we do it where we put it all over social media for the entire world to see. So, so I invite you this morning, with all of us sitting in this room, if you are sitting here and you're saying, I need to say yes, or you are sitting here and saying, I need to renew my vows that I made to Jesus, do it for all to see. Don't hide it. Don't be ashamed. Say, Jesus, you are all in, and I am all in too.